a lot of new members here and some who are likely just visiting today. So for those of you that do not know me, I am not Brett Kapranica, the uh, teaching pastor here at Summit Woods Baptist Church. My name is Mark Kristiniak. I'm one of the lay elders here at Summit Woods. And today we're going to set aside our study of Genesis that Brett has been going through. And we're going to look at a passage that is the fifth in our series on evangelism that the elders and staff have been preaching through throughout this year. Evangelism is an area that we have, as elders have identified that we would like to increasingly focus on as a body here at Summit Woods Church. To that end, Daniel Pentamone and several others have been organizing and serving on an evangelism team. We, the elders and staff, as I said, have been teaching on evangelism throughout this year. And as always, we will continue to teach the Bible in various ministries here. For instance, the nine o'clock equipping class that you all just attended, I'm sure. And the reason we do that is because we desire to equip the body for among other reasons to evangelize the lost. So the question that they, the evangelism team, and we here at Summit Woods, the body of this church, must continually be asking and evaluating is what is the best way to engage the world on behalf of Christ? How can we be most effective in communicating the most important message there has ever been or ever will be, and that is the gospel? How do we engage a world that increasingly denies God and is often openly hostile to biblical Christianity? I mean, let's face it, we live in a culture, in a world that seems to increasingly be opposed to what the Bible calls good, whether it's marriage, family, sexuality, the sanctity of life, many other issues, the world has sought to upset the things that God has created, the things that he has called good. Imagine with me, if you will, if you could put all of those things, sanctity of life, marriage, into a big bowl, imagine this, the world has turned that bowl upside down, haven't they? When I read through the news or when I scroll through Twitter, which I do, probably more than I should, but when I do that, I can't help but being reminded of how Isaiah 5 describes the wicked. He says, those, they are those that call good and good evil. They substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. The unsaved world too often gets God's goodness upside down, doesn't it? What God gave humans for flourishing, the world increasingly condemns. It's not new, this has always been true to one degree or another. Remember the description of mankind prior to the flood in Genesis 6, where we're told that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only continually evil. God created a world that was right side up. It was perfect. Genesis 1, God saw all that he had made and behold, he said it was very good. It was perfect. We, mankind, beginning with the first two humans, Adam and Eve, have upset God's creation. And apart from Christ, it remains so. Ironically, in verse 6 of our passage, Paul and his fellow Christians are accused of being the ones who upset the world. Did they? They certainly did but not in the way their accusers meant it. What their accusers called bad 
God calls good. That is the spread of the gospel, the redemption of sinners, the making of disciples, the building up of the body of Christ, his church. That was Paul's focus, and it should be ours as well. Just as Paul did in every city that he visited on his mission trips, he went there to proclaim the gospel. And in each city, as happened in Thessalonica, some of those who heard it, some of those he evangelized, were persuaded, as our text says, and they joined Paul, and in this case, in Thessalonica, Silas. By the grace of God, in the efforts of Paul and his followers, churches were established. The gospel took root, and the world was being turned back, right side up, one convert at a time. Everywhere he went, some believed, others opposed him, usually forced to depart, ostensibly because he upset the world, which he did in a good way. But why is the gospel so upsetting to the unregenerate world? It's because the gospel upsets the worldview of the unsaved worldly person. What do I mean by worldview? Well, worldview is how each of us sees the world, and every person has a worldview. We each see the world in a particular way. We come to believe certain things about ourselves, about others, about the world. That's called a worldview. And within the world are those who could be described as worldly. We might call them unregenerate. A worldly person in broad terms, according to Webster's Dictionary, is one who is devoted to the world and its pursuits. To paraphrase the Apostle John, they love the world and the things of the world, but not God. So, if you're a worldly person who clings to the things of the world and you're confronted with the gospel, you will either believe it or you will reject it. Either way, you will be forced to decide. One way or another, your world will be upset. And as we'll see in this morning's passage, and as we know from our own lives, the gospel can provoke a variety of responses. Some good, others not so much, but do know this. God will use them all in ways that we may not always understand for his plan of redemption. Because the gospel is God's plan of redemption for this fallen world. He redeems and restores unbelievers. He sets us apart as his own and will one day restore the world to its original perfection. It will be turned right side up. And then and now, Jesus Christ is the only way to bring about that rest restoration. The gospel is exclusive. And the fact that it's exclusive, there's an exclusive message, that upsets the world. And that's what this passage is about, evangelism and how the gospel upsets the world and the results that we can expect to follow. In what ways will the world be upset when it's evangelized with the gospel? Well, in our passage, we're gonna see three results of the gospel upsetting the world, and what we need to consider in our response. The first is found in verses one to four. Some of those who are evangelized with the gospel by God's grace will understand and believe. That's verses one to four. The lives of those who hear and understand and believe the gospel will be upset. They will be transformed. They will begin anew. That's the ultimate goal of evangelism, isn't it? To upset worldly lives with the truth of God's plan of redemption, the gospel. For sinners, 
to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it's God's pleasure to use men and women just like ourselves as his means to accomplish his goal as instruments to reach the lost. And by the grace of God, the word of God and the spirit of God, it happened consistently in Paul's ministry and will continue to happen until the Lord returns. So let's first recap how it is Paul came to be in Thessalonica. That's in our passage in verse one. We'll look at the passage and see how his evangelistic efforts played out in the city of Thessalonica. And we'll examine what we can learn from this experience and how that applies to our lives today. So Paul sets out on his second missionary journey with every intention of going to Asia. However, he has a dream. And he, in that dream, is given a vision. He determines that that dream and that vision, in fact, come from God and told he should go to Europe, not Asia. So he does, he goes to Macedonia, he obeys the vision, he goes to Philippi, which is a city in Macedonia where it's recorded in Acts 16. He proceeds, as he was wont to do, to throw the city into confusion. He upsets it with the gospel. So for his trouble, he and Silas are beaten, they're arrested, but providentially, they're released on a technicality because Paul's a Roman citizen and his beating and arrest were therefore unlawful, so they released them. And off they go to Thessalonica, which is where we will pick up in verse one. When they, Paul, Silas, and the others that were traveling with them had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. They traveled on what we today would call an interstate highway, a superhighway. It was called the Ignatian Way, and it was the main commercial thoroughfare for that reason, region. And they cover 100 miles in just three days, which is pretty amazing, considering that they had just been severely beaten and imprisoned. It is likely they would have had to travel perhaps on horseback. We're not told that. Nevertheless, they cover 100 miles, three days. They pass through the cities. Amphipolis and Apollonia, and as far as we know, they did not stop to, re, to uh, proclaim the gospel in those cities. So they come to Thessalonica, which is the capital city of the Roman province of Macedonia, and it still exists today. By the way, I was a few years ago in the Athens airport, and I looked up at the arrival and departure screen, and lo and behold, it said Thessalonica. I just thought that was kind of cool. That, a city from the Bible was actually on the, uh, it, Corinth was also up on there as well. So it still exists today. It, it's, uh, I'm sure, much larger than it, it was at that time. It, back then, it was probably one to 200,000 people by estimates. But it was a big city by the standards of that time. It's a port city. It's on the Aegean Sea and is, was a hub for politics and for culture. So by any means, it is, a me by any measure, it's what we would call a worldly city. And at that time, as I'm sure it is today, it was predominantly a Gentile city, although uh, there was a large Jewish population and there, and that's in the city and there, and that's where Paul goes first in the second half of verse one, it says there was a synagogue of the Jews and according to Paul's custom, verse two, he went to them. So we might ask, why would Paul be in the habit of first going to the synagogue, which he almost always did when he arrived in a new city? I think likely for a couple of reasons. For one thing, he was Jewish, and he would have been given an audience to do what he came to do, which was to teach the scriptures. Secondly, had he gone to the Gentiles first, he would have most likely offended the Jews since he himself was a Jew and it was a matter of respect that he would go to them first. So I think we need to pause here and consider what we can learn from this, from Paul's approach to evangelizing in Thessalonica and in other cities. I think there's at least four things 
that we can learn here from Paul. The first is this. When you seek to evangelize, be considerate. Observe some type of decorum. In other words, don't be a hindrance by being unnecessarily rude or offensive. Know who you're dealing with. Know what their customs are. What's the expectations of their culture? Being a Jew, Paul went to the Jews first because that's what they would have expected. If, on the other hand, you're going as a worker to a predominantly Muslim country, as we learned from our recent visitors, it's the same thing. You need to get to know their customs. You need to get to know their worldview. What are their expectations? Because their culture is different than ours. So we need to be considerate. When you seek to evangelize, you should have a plan. By that, I mean you need to determine when and where you can best engage. Paul knew that to be the synagogue, so that's where he went. Now, it's going to look different for each of us because we each have different people and circumstances in our lives, but I'm guessing a family dinner table at a holiday gathering may not be the best place for a clash of worldviews to take place. It actually may hinder rather than help the cause of the gospel. Perhaps it would be better to plan to have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with certain family members because that might be more productive. At any rate, as much as possible, we need to have a plan. Third, when you seek to evangelize, be respectful of other people's time. As much as you may want to engage your coworkers, is it appropriate to do it on company time? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know, but you need to consider that in advance. Paul was given time to teach in the synagogue and he used it wisely. Fourth, when you seek to evangelize, you need to get a passport. What I mean by that is if you've taken our counseling training, you'll, you'll know that when you speak into someone's life, when you intrude on their worldview, it should be done with their permission. So just as we need a court to enter a foreign country, we should get permission, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, to have a serious gospel conversation with someone. We need to get a passport. We need to make sure that they're open for discussion. Again, in Paul's case, they were open to discussion. Now, they certainly did not like everything he had to say, but at least he was given the opportunity to say it. So as we said, Paul being Jewish starts in the synagogue where he has a passport. And in the second half of verse two, we're told that for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He likely was in Thessalonica for several months, but for at least three of those Sabbaths, he went to the synagogue and he reasoned with them from the scriptures. What does it mean that he reasoned? Well, the Greek word for reason is dialogomai, which is where we get the English word for dialogue. So this tells us that rather than go in there with some prepared formal sermon, Paul would have conducted more of a discussion with those present. He would have fielded questions most likely from them. There would have been some back and forth taking place. I think this is helpful for us to picture uh, because many of us, myself included, when we're explaining the gospel or some other topic, we get so focused on what we're saying that we forget to check to see how it's being received. We forget to ask questions. In other words, we forget to have a dialogue. In my experience, a dialogue with someone is usually much more effective than one of my monologues, which may seem very brilliant to me, 
but may likely be putting my listener to sleep. So what was Paul dialoguing about? Well, this is the heart of our passage, and it was the heart of Paul's gospel ministry, and it should be for us as well. Look at verse 3. He was explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's that Savior that you've been waiting on. Again, there's a lot for us to consider here about the subject of evangelizing. So we're going to take another little pause and, and examine some of those things. The first is this. When you seek to evangelize, know your audience. Who is Paul dialoguing with and why does it matter? He's in a synagogue. We learned that in verse 4. In addition to that, there are Jews present, plus a large number of God-fearing Greeks and some of the leading women of the community. But they're all in a synagogue. So we can surmise from that that they had at least some level of knowledge of the Jewish scriptures, what we would call the Old Testament. So why is that important? It's important because when Paul was explaining and giving evidence, he could presuppose certain things about about their level of knowledge, such as who they believe God to be. They would have agreed with Paul on the nature of God. They would have had an understanding of the egregiousness of sin. They would have understood the sacrificial system and the need for atonement for sin when Paul spoke to them of the cross. They would have understood the priesthood when Paul told them that Jesus is our great high priest, the culmination of the priesthood. Now, most of them probably would not, well, we know they did not all agree with his conclusions, but they would have at least known the terms that he was using, what he was referring to. And there was a shared hope of the coming Messiah, which of course is where it probably would have gotten pretty dicey because Paul says this Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He's the one who the scripture is pointing to, which is where he likely would have lost most of them. But at least up to that point, he was speaking their language. Paul knew his audience. Do you? We live in a culture where the understanding of the basics of the Bible are like a foreign language to most people. As I said earlier, what God calls good, the world calls evil and vice versa. The Jews in Paul's day would have known a lot about the holiness of God and why sin is so offensive to him. What is our world? know about the holiness of God. Why should they even care? Holiness is viewed as a hindrance to self-fulfillment in our culture. What about sin? Nowadays, most people are trained to think that things like homosexuality are normal and certainly not sinful. Creation. Have they really considered that there is a biblical explanation for the creation of the universe? Everyone wants to know where we come from, but most people in our culture do not take the time to seriously consider that subject, or they accept the secular explanation that everything come, came from the single cell and the primordial ooze and voila, what you see today is what came out of that puddle of mud. All I'm saying is this. With many of those that we seek to evangelize, we have a different starting place than Paul had in the synagogues. We're speaking a different language. 
The world has a different epistemology and a diff different anthropology, which is just a fancy way of saying they have a different source of knowledge and a different understanding of the nature of man than Christians do. As Christians, our epistemology, we see God as the source of knowledge. We see the authority and the, and the sufficiency of scripture as being our source for knowledge. Our anthropology, our understanding of the nature of man is that man is inherently sinful. Whereas the secular worldview, broadly speaking, sees man as inherently good and also as being the source of knowledge. So think about that. It makes a huge difference when you're discussing the gospel with someone. And by the way, there are many professing Christians who think that way too. So don't presuppose anything. Ask questions, have a dialogue. Secondly, when you're seeking to evangelize, know your topic. What do I mean by that? Well, Paul had the opportunity, as he did many times in many synagogues, when, it, when he was given that opportunity, he was not only able to explain the scripture, but to give evidence from the scripture that what he was telling them about the Messiah was true. Can you do that? Can you explain the full narrative of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? I was talking to one of our members this week. I'm not seeing him here this morning. His initials are Kevin Hawker. <laughs> and he recounted to me how he became a Christian. What happened to him before he became a Christian? He was a single parent responsible for um, raising an eight-year-old son. But his neighbor recognized the need that he had, so he invited him over to dinner one night. And to use my, my term, he obtained a passport from Kevin and began over ex an extended period of time, over months, to explain the Bible to him. Eventually, he went to church and he came to believe in Christ he was converted, and he's somewhere today, but I don't see him here today. So listen to this. Kevin is currently doing what his neighbor did for him with a professing Christian who God has sovereignly put in his life, a man who has a very confused understanding of the Bible. But Kevin is taking the time to explain and give evidence from scripture and by god's grace this person is beginning to understand the true meaning of scripture given the opportunity could you reason explain and give evidence from the bible about christ about who he is and why this person that you're speaking with needs to come to know him as Lord and Savior. And I'm not talking about just sharing the gospel. You know, holy God, sinful man, Jesus, faith, repentance. Every bit of which is absolutely essential. But most people don't have the worldview to even comprehend what we're saying when we mean that, when we explain that. That's why what we're saying, how we're saying it, is so important. I'm talking about sitting down with someone and opening the Bible to Genesis 1 and explain and give evidence about the Creator God, about the fall of man, God's plan of redemption through Abraham, the necessity of the cross, Christ's suffering, His atonement for our sin, His first and second advent, the new heaven and the new earth, all of which is foretold and explained in God's sufficient word. It's incumbent upon us to understand and be able to explain that to others. It's necessary for us to do that because the unregenerate world, for the most part, has never seriously considered most of these things. And listen, I speak from experience. I was that person at one time, 20 years ago. For the most part, I didn't understand and I didn't much care one way or another about the Bible. 
But God put people in my life, especially my friend Jim Childers, who over a period of several years patiently taught me the truth of the scripture until one day I came to believe. Now, I realize it takes the work of the Spirit to open our hearts to the truth of the Bible. But as I said earlier, I know this also, that God uses men and women, he uses us as the means to his end to evangelize the lost so that sinners may be saved. That's why Peter tells us in his first epistle in chapter 3, verse 15, a familiar passage, that we're always to be ready to make a defense, to explain and give evidence to everyone who asks, to give an account for the hope that we have. Yet we're to do so with gentleness and reverence. We're to be respectful. We're not to be argumentative. We're to do it with our passport in hand. Which brings us to our next point. When you evangelize, be sure to pick your battles carefully. What do I mean by that? Well, we know from studying Paul's ministry that he was singularly focused on the gospel, relying on the word of God and the spirit of God everywhere he went. In his first letter to the Corinthian church in chapter 2, Paul reminded them this. He said, when I came to you, I was determined to know nothing among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In this notoriously worldly city of Corinth, Paul preached the gospel, not politics. It's not wrong to have opinions or discussions on politics, but we're wise to be careful about when, where, and with whom we engage on those topics like that. Folks that we perhaps hope to engage for Christ could be easily put off by our political posts that they see from us on social media, or maybe about the way we speak of people they admire in politics that we consider to be our opponents. We need to be always thinking before we engage in the wrong battle. And finally, fourth point we learn from this, when we are evangelizing, we need to learn to expect God-ordained results. Look at verse 4. And some of them, the Jews, were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. So within this synagogue in Thessalonica, there's this cross-section of the Greco-Roman world. There's Jews, there's Greeks, there's leading women from that community, and some of these people were persuaded. Now, the verb tense that is used here for persuaded is the passive tense, which could indicate God's work in making them part of the new community of believers in Thessalonica. But we're not specifically told that all who believed what Paul was saying were actually converted. We just can't always know that. We do know, however, that Jesus himself as recorded in Matthew 28, calls us to go and to make disciples, which is what Paul did. He evangelized the lost. He started churches in numerous cities, including Thessalonica, for the purpose of making disciples, and God honored and used his efforts. And as it goes with us, I'm sure, Things didn't always happen the way Paul would have expected them or even wished them to have gone. But by God's grace, even in Thessalonica, where he was forced to leave prematurely, a church was established and disciples were made. When the gospel is proclaimed, when we evangelize the lost world, we can always expect results. 
we can expect that lives will be upset one way or another. Some will be persuaded and others, of course, will not. And that's the second section of this passage. It's found in verses five to seven. What happens when the gospel upset the world of those who reject it? We've all seen this to one degree or another. Some will attack those who proclaim the gospel when their worldview is upset by it. It's not surprising at all, is it? What happened to Paul and Silas in Thessalonica is not unlike what happens today when the gospel collides with the world. There's likely going to be an attack in one form or another by those who take offense to the gospel. Now, the culture that we live in, the attacks are more likely to come over social media by voices that are seeking to discredit biblical Christianity. And increasingly, there are legal rulings that are being brought against some that are teaching the Bible, for instance, on sexuality. We're beginning to see that. Now, throughout Paul's ministry, and, and as happened in our Lord's earthly ministry, the attacks were more often than not of a physical nature, ultimately resulting in the martyrdom of most of the apostles and, of course, death on the cross for Jesus. But just like today, there were also legal attempts, as we'll see in a minute, to silence those who proclaim the gospel. Back then, it was the self-proclaimed religious Jews that seemed to be the primary opponents of the gospel. Whereas today, the attacks are more likely to come from the secular culture, or even in some cases, from professing Christians that do not, those that do not hold to the sufficiency and the authority of Scripture. Verse 5, we're told it's the Jews, they're the ones that take offense, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob, and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jacob, Jason, they were seeking to bring them, meaning Paul and Silas, out to the people. Why do you suppose they were jealous of the gospel? It's because the gospel steals their sheep. They had built for themselves a worldly system of works righteousness, and that's where they gained tremendous amount of worldly power. So the gospel is an attack on their world religious system. So how did they strike back? Well, they kind of used a two-pronged method of attack. They started first by attempting to turn the city against the Christians in the form of a riot, and then we'll see later, in effect, sought to legislate the gospel out of the city. So what did they do? Well, the New American Standard describes a group of men as wicked men. Other translations call them rabble or loafers. At any rate, this seemed to be the kind of men that probably didn't care one way or another what cause they were fighting for. They were just looking for a reason to fight. So they gather them together. They create this mob to set the city in an uproar, which is, of course, ironically, what they accuse Paul of doing. And they go to the house of Jason, where they think they will find Paul and Silas. Now, we don't know exactly who Jason is, but presumably he is one of the men in the synagogue that Paul persuaded. Verse 6, when they did not find them, Paul and Silas, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have upset the world, there's our phrase, have come here also. But the men set the world, Paul and Silas, they're gone. They left for Berea because sometimes it's better to live to fight another day. And we know this about Paul. Despite intense opposition, he never quit fighting. 
And we know also from the account of what happened in Berea that the Jews of Thessalonica didn't either because they followed Paul to Berea and kept fighting against him, against his proclamation of the gospel, which was upsetting their worldly religious system. But meanwhile, in Thessalonica, the Jews have to be content with going after Jason. So phase one was the riot. Phase two comes in the form of a legal attack. They bring two charges against Jason and his companions. And the first one really is pretty weak. It's in verse seven. Jason has welcomed them, meaning the men who in their eyes have upset the world. So Jason, in effect, is being charged with guilt by association because these guys aren't even there anymore. So this is pretty weak. However, the second charge has a little more substance, even though it is completely misguided. Look at the second half of verse 7, where the accusation is made that they all act contrary to the, to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. Of course, we do know that Jesus is king. He's the Lord of all. But we also know that God ordains all earthly rulers. God will let Caesar be Caesar for as long as it suits God's purposes. Paul preached a messianic king. He's preaching an eternal king, not an earthly one. He's not preaching a theocracy. That's not the goal of evangelism or biblical Christianity. And by the way, the religious Jews are not demonstrating their undying loyalty to Caesar. You understand that. They're just using whatever means they can to go against the gospel. This is about what they perceive, they rightly perceived, to be a threat to their worldly religious kingdom, and they're right about that because it is. Because Christ renders useless all works based religion, which is what they practice, because He alone is sufficient for sinful man to be reconciled to a holy God. So we know this when the message of the gospel is delivered, some will believe it. Others are going to attack because it's a direct threat to their worldview, to their earthly desires. Today, the secular culture, just like the religious Jews in Paul's day, they will attack when their perceived rights are threatened. As we said earlier, those things such as the perceived right to abortion, to same-sex marriage, when those are threatened, not just because they're about to become illegal, but because people are going to turn against them. The goal of biblical Christianity is not necessarily to outlaw those things, but it's rather to transform the hearts of, of those who practice such things, to turn their view of sin right side up. And when they begin to call it what God calls it, which is sin, they will repent and increasingly turn from those desires. That's the real battlefield. You understand that. It's not the legislature. The battlefield is the heart. And apart from Christ, fallen men will pursue unrighteousness, but the gospel will upset that pursuit. And as we'll see in verses 8 and 9, to protect their worldly desires, some will seek to suppress the truth of the gospel. That's our third and final section. Some will seek to suppress the gospel when it has upset their world. How will they attempt to suppress it? Phase one, verse eight, they stirred up the crowd, they get a mob on their side. Phase two, they bring the law, that's the second half of verse eight, the city authorities, they bring them in to try and squelch the gospel. Now Thessalonica was technically a free city in the Roman Empire, but it certainly would have been in the best interest of the rulers, those that, that were in charge there, 
if they wanted to remain free to make sure they're on the right side of Caesar. So the ears of the authorities would perk up when they hear of a potential king that's threatening Caesar's authority, and they have to act. They gotta do something because it's in their best earthly interest. So what do they do? Well, verse nine, when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Essentially, Jason is just given a slap on the wrist. He's let out on to re receive a pledge would have meant that the authorities took money as security, which would be forfeited by Jason if Paul and his companions were to cause any trouble. But they're gone, right? So the case is closed. It's the end, or is it? Were they successful in suppressing the gospel in Thessalonica? Paul did leave Thessalonica, as we said, to fight another day. He went to Berea, then he went to Athens, which is what's recorded in the remainder of chapter 17. But we also know from the two recorded letters that he wrote to the church at Thessalonica that there was indeed a church planted and started there, that his gospel work did indeed take root. Listen to, you don't have to turn there, but 1 Thessalonians, you're going to read a few verses from this. 1 Thessalonians verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, the church of the Thessalonians, and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. He goes on to say in verse 4, Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need of anything. Does that sound like the gospel was suppressed in Thessalonica? God's word by his spirit will always thrive, maybe not in ways that we readily see, but God has a plan of redemption and he is working it to his perfection. We know this, when the gospel is proclaimed, some will believe, some will attack, some will seek to suppress it, but God's will prevail according to his plan and he'll use us as the instruments to evangelize the lost, to teach the truth of the word to the world, to make disciples. Our job is to just do it well, to be equipped to seek opportunities here and abroad to be prepared to make the most of every one of them and ultimately to trust God for the results. Let's pray. Father, how grateful we are for the grace and truth of your gospel. The good news that you redeem sinners by the atoning work of your son on the cross and your acceptance of that atonement demonstrated by his resurrection gives us hope. He lives that we may live. I pray you would use each of us who have embraced your gift as long as we are alive on this earth to pursue the lost, those who are perishing. Help us in this church to be faithful evangelizers and disciple makers, to be equipped and to equip others 
as instruments in your hands. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand.